Welcome to the podcast of the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. I'm Josie Briggs, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal, and I'm delighted to have with me today a guest uh, next year's to talk about an exciting paper in our January issue. Nick is the lead author on a paper entitled GWAS in Mice, Maps Susceptibility to HIV-Associated Nephropathy to the SSVP2 Locus. So, Nick, your study takes on the challenge of understanding the lesion pathologists call collapsing glomerulopathy. It's a lesion of particular interest right now. What do we know about it? Good morning, and thank you very much for letting us talk about our paper. Um, collapsing glomerulopathy is a variant of focal segmental glomerosclerosis, and it generally has a poor prognosis. The name comes from the fact that the glomerular capillary tufts are collapsed in collapsing glomerulopathy, and the podocytes, the critical cell in the glomerulus, show evidence of apoptosis and proliferation. There are many viral diseases that are associated with collapsing glomerulopathy. The classic example is HIV-1, resulting in HIVAN, but associated with other viral diseases, such as parvovirus B19 and cytomegalovirus, and most recently, SARS-CoV-2 has been reported. ACE2 is a receptor for SARS-CoV-2 entry into cells, and it has been reported to, to be the express on the surface of podocytes. Although collapsing glomerulopathy has been reported in SARS-CoV-2 infections, it remains unclear if the virus directly affects podocytes. It is also possible an indirect effect. The inflammatory cytokine storm could also cause podocyte dysregulation. Presently, the mechanisms that govern collapsing glomerulopathy in SARS-CoV-2 infections remain unknown, including whether podocytes themselves become infected. There are reports in the literature demonstrating kidney cells are susceptible to virus, but other reports suggest SARS-CoV-2 does not directly infect kidney cells. In any case, collapsing glomerulopathy appears to be a relatively rare complication of COVID-19, but an important one with poor prognosis. Right, an important lesion right now to understand better. To return to HIV, was it clear before you started these experiments that there was a genetic factors that affect susceptibility to collapsing glomerulopathy? There is clearly genetic predisposition in humans. Individuals with two risk, risk variants in the APOL1 gene already implicated in FSGS are highly predisposed to collapsing glomeropathy from viral infections. The mechanisms leading to collapsing glomeropathy from viral infections are not clear, but it appears that the host antiviral immune response, particularly interfer interference accretion, results in the upregulation of APOL1 gene products. And the APOL1 risk alleles results in expression of an APOL1 variant proteins that are toxic to podocytes. So we already knew that APOL1 is a genetic susceptibility factor in HIVAN in humans. In addition, based on our prior studies in HIV-1 transgenic models, we knew that in different inbred strains of mice have different susceptibility to developing collapsing glomerulopathy. Right, so different susceptibility in different strains of mice. And how did you tackle the question of actually finding what genes are responsible for that variation in susceptibility? So mice are not susceptible to HIV infection. So in order to model HIV infection, about 30 years ago, investigators developed a transgenic mouse model where replication deficient form of the virus was expressed as a transgene in the mouse. It was noted that the transgenic mouse, which was on the FVBN background, is susceptible to, H to the HIV-1 transgene and develops a kidney disease which highly resembles HIVAN from the histopathology and the molecular standpoint. Subsequently, it was noted that when the transgene was bred into different genetic backgrounds, some have no disease, demonstrates that host susceptibility factors are involved. Right. So you undertook back crosses with 20 strains. What a big undertaking. What were the steps? We made F1 crosses of the HIV-1 transgenic mouse 
with 20 inbred strains and followed them for eight weeks for development of disease. Blood and urine were collected on a weekly basis for BUN and proteinuria measurements. In collaboration with Professor Vivette de Gatti, kidney pathology was analyzed in a blinded fashion and the degree of glomerosclerosis casts tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis and inflammation was quantified. Congratulations on careful blinding. This is an important element of rigor that is sometimes shortchanged. I was very struck in your paper on the marked degree of strain variability. You saw some strains show virtually no pathology and no impairment of functions, while in others the phenotype is full-blown. I think, if I remember correctly, this kind of strain dependence is not seen in diabetic models or hypertension models. Comments? So we, we expected to see a degree of variability based on our previous work. However, we were surprised to see this, the, the spectrum of variability. As an example, C57 black six mice were entirely resistant to the HIV-1 transgene, and the AGM mice were almost 100% susceptible. The standard model um, on the FBB background shows about 60% penetrance. Identifying mouse strains with consistent pathology, either no pathology, mild pathology, or severe pathology, will benefit future high band research. The next step was a genome-wide association study. The pathology scores and the concentration of urine NGAL and BUN were used as phenotypes for the GWAS. We did this work in collaboration with Yas Gupta in Dr. Simone Sanakirke's lab. And using the genetic data available from the Mouse Genome Project at the Sanger Center in the UK. We ultimately mapped genetic susceptibility to the SSBP2 locus on chromosome 13 and demonstrated that SSBP2 was expressed in podocytes. The expression studies use a single cell sequencing approach alongside public available data sets and our immunohistochemistry chemistry demonstrated SSBP2 was in the presence of the glomerulus of wild type mice while it was reduced in the HIV-1 transgenic mice. Quite a powerful series of methods. Uh, Jason is very proud of a way in which some of those resources we've published are contributing to complex studies like this. You relied heavily on the most Sanger Center data. Can you uh, explain to our listeners how that worked and what the value was? In prior eras, it was only possible to map loci underlining phenotypic difference between two strains. And classic Classic mapping with intercrosses or backcrosses had a very re low resolution. Typically, studies would map loci to 50 million base regions. Now we have the sequence data available for most mouse inbred strains. We know that these strains are descendants of the same common ancestors, and in effect, each inbred strain represents a branch of the same large family. Thus, if we see phenotypic similarities between different strains, for example, coat color or susceptibility to some disease, we can infer that these are likely, likely attribute to variation in of the same genes. Therefore, this provides the opportunity to map, map genetic susceptibility by determining phenotype similarities between a large number of strains and correlating, with those, with, correlating this with the genome sequence data, essentially comparing where genome variation matches phenotype variation. All of this can be done without using any new sequencing data since the genomes of the inbred mice strains have been sequenced by a public effort and are available online. So it all comes down to careful extensive phenotypic and data analysis to identify shared segments of the genome that match the, pheno the phenotype pattern. Right, incredible and important. So the GWAS on these 344 animals yielded the locus on chromosome 13. But there still were a number of possible genes in the in region of this locus. You narrowed it down to SSBP2. Nick, can you explain to our listeners how you did this narrowing down? So the, the, the GWAS um, identified a locus on chromosome 13, which encoded 14 genes. Our next job was to figure out which of these were the most likely gene involved in the pathogenesis of collapsing glomerulopathy. To prioritize the candidate genes, we used publicly available data sets alongside our own data. 
We performed single cell sequencing of a kidney from an FBB mouse to identify how these 14 genes were expressed in different kidney cell types. We also used public available data sets using the kidney interactive transcriptomics from ben, Dr. Benjamin Humphrey's lab and the protein atlas. The single cell data and public available data sets all, pin, all pointed to SSBP2 as the most likely candidate. SSBP2 was strongly expressed in the podocytes and the cell type that are dysregulated in Hyvan. Other databases show that SSBP2 interacts with LMX1B, and we, have, and we know that mutations in LMX1B causes a form of FSGS. We also demonstrated a reduction of the expression of SSBP2 in the glomerulus of 12 week old HIV1 transgenic mice compared to age matched wild type mice. We were also able to obtain additional information about mouse knockouts from the mouse phenome database. Finally, we realized that SSBP2 null mice had been generated and older mice were reported to have nephropathy, but the actual kidney lesions were not well described. Therefore, we contacted Dr. Nagarajan, who had generated the SSBP2 knockout mice and shared his pathology information. We then reviewed the slides that she sent to us, and we saw that the mice had a collapsing glomerulus phenotype, similar to what is seen in our HIV-1 transgenic mice. Thus, the aggregate, the majority of uh, the evidence points to SSPP2 as a high priority candidate gene produced, producing susceptibility to nephropathy in the high event mouse model. Right. So, uh, a convincing but not absolutely definitive proof. Some of our reviewers uh, pushed and said it was an educated guess. Uh, what would be the real definitive proof that this gene is in fact causal? Absolutely, we made an educated guess, uh, but we have not proven causality. GWAS, whether in mice or humans, maps a locus, and then one has to identify the causal gene among a list of candidates. In mice, to test, the one test would be to substitute the genetic segments containing a risk allele from a resistant into, into a susceptible strain or vice versa to see if the substitution results in the expected phenotype or we could knock out SSBP2 in a resistant strain to see if now we make it susceptible to HIVAN. We are taking the latter approach in, in our lab. In terms of mechanism, we speculate that SSBP2 contributes to collapsing glomeropathy because it prevents the ubiquitin mediated degradation of the transcriptional adapter protein called LIM demanding, so LIM domain binding protein 1, LDB1, which enables the transcription of LMX1B target genes such as NPHS2 and COL4A3. Remember, LMX1B mutations cause a form of FSGS, and we know that podocyte specific inactivation of LDB1 or LMX1B in mice results in kidney failure from FSGS. We hypothesize that HIV1 perturbs the interaction of SSBP2 with LDB1 and LMX1B, and ultimately leads to podocyte dysregulation. Elucidating the molecular me mechanisms of SSBP2, podocyte dysfunction, and glomerular tuff collapse in the setting of HIV social nephropathy is part of our current and future research. Right, very interesting story. And the direct involvement of viral proteins or indirect effect of, of viral immune activation uh, is also an unsolved aspect of this interesting story. Now, people wonder as they look about this paper, uh, how relevant is this to people? It, what, what would you say to that question? It's not known whether SSVP2 locus modifies the risk of collapsing glomeropathy, FSGS, or other kidney disease in humans. Consultation with public available databases such as NOMAD indicate that SSPP2 is, is highly mutation intolerant. In other words, there are very few people who carry the loss of function mutations in SSPP2. Analysts 
uh, analysts of exome data from uh, 3,150 patients with various forms of CKD from one of our prior publications in, in uh, JASN also showed or, or did not identify any rare variant signals in SSPP2. This data suggests that delete, 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 deleterious mutations of SSPP2 are probably, probably rare in humans and association analysis on nephropathy will require very large sample sizes. However, mouse models are informative because they may highlight pathways that can be investigated in human disease. We know that not every person with APOL1 risk genotypes develops FSGS, and not every person with collapsing glomeropathy has the APOL1 risk genotype. Mice do not have the APOL1 gene, but somehow some strains develop collapsing glomeropathy, similar to humans who do not carry the APOL1 risk genotypes. Thus, there may be additional risk, risk pathways that we can discover in the mouse and then can, and can inform about the pathogenesis of collapsing glomerulopathy in humans, and we plan to explore these pathways in large cohorts. Right, a fascinating evolving story with many steps yet to come. Uh, so thanks for for very uh, insightful uh, discussion of this. We will be uh, waiting with eagerness to learn the next uh, steps. Thank you very much, Dr. Steers. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology, all rights reserved. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. This podcast should not be used in a medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified healthcare provider if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast from the American Society of Nephrology.